Welcome back, everybody. We're doing another episode of Indie Reads Aloud. I am so excited. Jennifer Rains comes back time and time again to be with us on the program. And I'm always excited when she does, because as you all know, I am a recovering six-year-old. First of all, I love to be read out loud to. Secondly, I love authors like Jennifer, Jennifer because she's so personable and so much fun to talk to. Hi, Jennifer. I'm so glad Hi, you're here. Diana. <laughs> and then the third thing is, which I, I know I beat this dead horse over and over again, but Jennifer lives in Australia. And that means she's a time traveler because she's actually in tomorrow when she talks to us today, which I think is just mind blowing. I will never, I'm 60 years old and I don't think I'm ever going to stop finding that a fascinating thing. So <laughs> welcome back. <laughs> We're also on the verge of autumn. And you're on the verge of spring. No, we're on the verge of autumn. Oh, we're on the verge of spring. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's just feeling quite chilly today. Okay, that's the first time that's ever happened. <laughs> My fault. <laughs> so much fun. So Jennifer has been here before. She's read quite a few of her books on her program. If you haven't heard them and you haven't heard Jennifer's backstory, you really need to go back into the archives and listen to her on our program. All you have to do is do a search for Jennifer Rains on the, um, on the archive and you'll be able to pull up all of her episodes. But Jennifer has won so many really cool awards for her books. Um, just to name a few, um, she's, she's won, oh my gosh, um, so she's a member of the Romance Writers of Australia, a three-time finalist in the Emerald competition. Um, she's a member of the Romance Writers of New Zealand, like one continent wasn't enough. You had to branch out to two. Um, she won the Pacific Hearts competition twice. I mean, so many amazing things. How do you... How do you keep this amazing level of acumen in your writing? How do you keep doing this over and over again? What, what is the magic secret? That's what everybody wants to know. Probably persistence. Um, oh, that's no Wanting fun. to tell a particular story. Okay, that's more fun. And, <laughs> and um, uh, it, it's just going over it again and again. I'm actually quite slow. And so it's uh, looking at it and going back. And um, I also think I'm quite good at accepting criticism. Mm. Um, there are those, there is that feedback I get where I throw it against the wall and I think this person is um, not on our planet. Um, <laughs> they need to read again. But after a couple of weeks, I check it out and everyone has something something valid to say uh, when they read a book because it's their response. And so I really try to keep quite an open mind on the feedback I get from beta readers and arc readers and things like that because I it's made it has improved my writing. So that's yeah. it. I think yeah. I, I think that's a really big thing and that I, I think it's a piece that a lot of authors miss is that you have to take that criticism, step back from it, so you have yeah. a little bit of distance so you're not emotionally wounded yes and and really unpack it and go okay it, how can i improve on this can i be a better yes. writer today than i was yesterday and it it teaches you also how subjective uh, in mm. it, you know in a rational kind of way how subjective reading is and therefore if one person turns away from your book that doesn't mean it's not a good book it doesn't mean it won't appeal to a, a different audience, but everyone brings um, not just their own background, but actually their mood at the moment. To oh, sure. Um, so you can read a book today and you can read it in a month and have a completely different reaction to it yes. because of and what's happening in your life or what's happening around you. Yeah, I, I agree. And I, I find walking into an art gallery exactly the same way. Yeah. In, in some days when I go to the Institute of Arts, um, paintings are very striking to me. And on other days, the same painting will make me grumpy. So, mm. yeah, and, and I, I think you're absolutely right there is that given the moment, given the individual, given the surroundings and whatever distractions are going on in life, literature can be 
taken in differently. Yes. So yeah. we kind of have to do that grain of salt thing. Mm. You know, like just understand that not everybody's in the same headspace when they read it. Yeah. I like that. But that I does mean, absolutely explain how you won so many amazing awards because you just keep at it and keep at it and keep at it. Yes, I... <laughs> um, yes, work work is required. <laughs> yeah, there's nothing <laughs> magical about it. I mean, the writing is magical, but to get to that magic... Yes, yes. And you do you do have those moments when you get up at the end of the day and you think, yes, I nailed something mm. then. Or, you know, and sometimes it's just a phrase. Um, but you yeah. think, yes, that's the perfect one. And then there are some days when you look over your writing at the end of the day and you think, I didn't write that. Where did that come from? Yeah. <laughs> so that's fun too. Yes. Tell me about the new book, Masquerade. This is Choosing Family Book One. This this intimates that there might be more books in this series. Yes, actually, this came out earlier this um, year, um, but I've had a busy year. And so the second book has uh, since come out and the third one is due in October. So that uh, means you're going to be coming back on the program two more times. <laughs> I might. I might. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to. Um, so tell me about Masquerade. What's the backstory to this one? Well, I saw a program on identical twins. Hmm. And I'd seen and read and and um come in contact with identical twins before. And everything was sort of emphasizing the closeness of the relationships. Um, some people dress the same, do everything the same, that's sort of an extreme, but identical twins. And I wondered what might fracture such a relationship that was so close between people. That's and an then I thought question. I'd add a second pair of identical twins. So I've got two sets of identical twins. And I'm thinking I'll have to draw a family tree for this one. Um, yeah, so the, <laughs> book one is one of the brothers and one of the sisters. Book two is the second brother. Book three is the second sister. So that's sort of how it works. But you've got the characters across them. And so, uh, yes, what, what would fracture a relationship so that that interfered with what was happening and then the other thing in in romance one of the biggest of course is deception and mistrust mm. and and trust then in... repair and renew that's right, right repairing deception and mistrust and then i came up with the idea is there any are there any good lies oh that's an interesting question yes i like that yeah. <laughs> so the um the sort of tagline for it is that I've got a masquerade, a road trip, a steamy attraction, and the steps that Liam and Kate took to protect their hearts might break them. Ooh, okay. Okay. I'm completely bought in now. <laughs> <laughs> this is really fun. I love your writing. So everything you write, I find tremendous. I can't wait to have you share this with our readers. When you are ready, please, ma'am, take the microphone and read aloud. Masquerade, Chapter One. Kate Turner plastered a confident smile on her face as George Cleland, founding partner of Cleland and Associates, led her towards his boardroom to meet his four best people. Suits any gender, were her least favourite people. Kate told herself that was a prejudice she should be over by now. But Kate had met too many who were wedded to the idea that charcoal grey wool cut in severe lines guaranteed they were always right. Her misgivings were her business and George's steady patter of encouragement was a palliative to the tension roiling in her gut. Halting inside the doorway, Kate scanned the room. The three suits present weighed her up and found her wanting. Her bland off the rack clothes were a jarring contrast to their designer suits. To the lawyers, 
Her drab outfit signaled she had no permanent place in their company. To her, being instantly forgettable represented success. Miss Dowdy researcher could hide in plain sight. Glad you could make it, Liam. George turned back towards the door, his body blocking her view of the fourth suit. Problems with the flight from Canberra? A bit of traffic from the airport. An alarm sounded in Kate's head. The Irish lilt was fainter, but the mellow baritone was ominously familiar. The newcomer moved to join the other three strangers. When her gaze met his, her stomach knotted while his polite smile faded. George began introductions. Kate shook hands as if she'd been programmed to meet and greet on command, while her heart raced like a runaway bride and her brain scrambled for purchase. Please, God, no. Kate Turner, meet Liam Quinn. George made the final introduction. The man's name provided the absolute confirmation Kate didn't need. Inhaling deeply, she met his gaze. Hello, Miss Turner. He held her hand longer than necessary, the living embodiment of all her least favourite stereotypes. An austere, charcoal-suited, silk-tied, face chiselled from marble, legal eagle, who regarded her with the wreck irritation of someone who'd found a worm in his perfect apple. The man packed speculation and suspicion into a simple handshake. Do I know you? He asked. Have you ID'd me? Memo to self. You will not. Repeat, not hyperventilate. Kate concentrated on simple inhalation and exhalation. In, two, three. Out, two, three. Nice and steady. I don't think so. You look familiar. I have that kind of face. Kate had let her guard down, allowed herself to believe the gods were finally on her side, that she could work, write and live again, free of shadows. I don't think so. He was persistent. Maybe I've seen a photo. Unlikely. In, two, three, out, two, three, four. Five. There was a Geno Search billboard on the route from the airport to Sydney's central business district. The public story was that Kate's identical twin, Anna, was the model featured in glorious colour on the billboard. Instead, Kate was the real billboard model, having abandoned her Miss Dowdy researcher disguise for the length of the photo shoot. Call me Kate. Had Liam seen through the costume, granting her anonymity from every other observer? The possibility was a body blow. No one had made the link between Miss Dowdy researcher Kate and the woman on the billboard. She'd gambled that no one ever would. Kate lifted a hand to make sure her fake glasses sat firmly on her nose. With her lack of makeup, very different hair colour, clothes and body language, it shouldn't be possible for anyone to pick her likeness to the woman on the billboard. Even after Liam Quinn released her hand, he studied her with a fierce intensity Kate struggled to ignore. The advertising company was doing a slow reveal. Kate's face had been in jigsaw pieces, but was now complete. Ultimately, two faces would appear on the billboard. In the last 24 hours, they'd added the outline of a male head and a pair of penetrating grey eyes. Had Liam recognised his identical twin, Neil, in the eyes of the male model on the billboard? Easily, probably, definitely. Damn. Let's start. George offered her the seat at his side. Kate sank into it, drawing strength from George's support. Her relief was short-lived when Liam took the chair opposite, exposing her to his focused power, pure, potent male. What had his brother Neil said about him? We've grown apart in recent years. Both were tall, broad-shouldered, with lean hips, long legs and eyes that missed not a blessed thing. The resemblance ended there. 
his warm-hearted cabinet maker brother hadn't made her skin prickle with awareness. Kate twisted her fingers together under the polished teak table away from his relentless scrutiny. I am not nervous. If he asked outright, she'd tell a room full of strangers the public version of the story. That her sister Anna was the creative genius behind a billboard campaign that also featured Liam Quinn's twin brother. Has everyone had a chance to read Kate's report? George, her temporary employer, was an exception to Kate's suit rule. She could ignore his Tom Ford three-piece because he had the charm of a man with nothing to prove. Short and stocky, he packed more charisma into a raised eyebrow than the lead in the romance novel on her bedside table. He'd spent his professional life building his successful Sydney-based legal practice into an Australian institution. There were murmurs of assent from, Kate couldn't remember the names of the other lawyers. Damn Liam Quinn for messing with my head. Self-preservation demanded she find out if he'd seen through her disguise, preferably without sharing the news with everyone present. I know you're keen to find out what this is all about and get back to other briefs, George said. As you know, intellectual property is where we've made our mark in the last few decades. It's in our DNA, the polished brunette said. We have the skills to diversify. You all have some previous experience with environmental litigation. George leaned back in his chair. Unlike Kate's father, George was open to the idea of adjusting his ideas to support his daughter's passions. I'm inviting each one of you to pick a case from Kate's report and outline your approach. I'll choose the strongest and offer our skills to the organisation concerned. It'll be a test case. If we find we can add this area of expertise to the company, it'll become an ongoing part of our work. The resulting silence held the stickiness of impending mutiny. Liam gestured to Kate's report open in front of him. Simple summaries of assorted environmental disputes across Australia. That's not a lot to work with. Have you read my report, Mr. Quinn? Kate emphasised his surname, annoyance at the snub for her research, trumping her anxiety at exposure. She'd back her research skills against anyone in this room. I've scanned it. His shoulder lifted in an offhand shrug. Arrogant moron. Another man living in an echo chamber, so sure his worldview was right, not even a drone buzzing overhead would alert him to imminent attack. Was he hostile because Neil had kept the billboard campaign secret from him? Or generally hostile to new ideas? Then you're being deliberately offensive. Not yet, Liam answered, leaning forward, a panther preparing to spring. Dismayed to be so attuned to his slightest movement, Kate stiffened her spine. Liam had a second guessing her defence strategy. Until Liam... Kate had trusted that Miss Dowdy researcher couldn't be linked to the billboard. The final stress test to confirm no one, especially not her besuited, controlling ex-boyfriend, would recognise Miss Dowder, Dowdy as Anna Turner's twin. You've each got 48 hours to select a project and outline the broad arguments she'll use if or when it comes to court. In 72 hours, George flashed a devilish grin. I'll announce which project will be our pilot. George's gaze rested on Liam. The older man inclined his head slightly and Liam's mouth curved in a rueful smile. Warmth brought a gleam to the flat grey of Liam's eyes for the split second the men connected. If Kate hadn't been so hyper aware of Liam, she'd have missed the moment of camaraderie. Respect and affection captured in the slightest of exchanges. George was playing a straight bat, giving all four lawyers an equal chance to bid for the project. But Kate's gut was telling her he wanted Liam to win this office competition. George trusted Liam to handle the biggest risk of his professional life. 
Will that give Liam the power to tear up my contract? Short-term and lucrative, Kate had penciled in six months of full-time writing in her cottage hideaway with the proceeds from this assignment. Achieving her writing dream depended on those six months. Kate will provide all additional research required for the winning pitch. I expect absolute confidentiality, George said. The other three partners bristled with the energy of finely tuned athletes poised to run the 100 metre dash. Now was the moment for Liam to voice his suspicions. If he had suspicions. His brooding gaze settled on her. He had suspicions. George's confidence in Kate might be about to face its own stress test. Will he challenge me now? I'm being paranoid. He can't know. Kate froze, helpless to control the outcome. Liam cleared his throat. With a heart in a mouth, Kate waited for the guillotine to fall. That mental high five she'd given herself on arrival when she'd thought all she needed to do was suck up the arrogance of a few suits to guarantee this job had jinxed her. Spit it out. George was unaware Kate was his protege's target. Can you wait outside, please, Miss Turner? Liam focused on a spot over her shoulder. Butterflies turned Olympic-class somersaults in her stomach. If you have questions about the report, I'm the best person to answer them. I don't, Liam answered. A matter of corporate clarity a consultant wouldn't be able to answer. Kate couldn't read him. He'd masked his earlier animosity, but the unspoken conjecture swirling in the temperature-controlled space added to her sense of being unsafe. Leaving at this point in the meeting was risky. She'd assumed Neil understood his brother. Now she wasn't so sure. Neil's comments had been along the lines of, stuck in his ivory tower, needs a shake-up. Liam's resoluteness made his position clear. He wasn't stuck anywhere. He knew exactly where he was and why. George smiled gently. Can you give us ten, please, Kate? Kate waited for the snick of the door closing. He'd work better without the face of George's hotshot researcher clouding his vision. Unsettled after reading the contents of Kate Turner's report during his flight to Sydney, the Geno search billboard had appeared like a mirage at the side of the road to the city. The image was incomplete, except for a close-up of a woman looking into a mirror. The model had mesmerised him. Hair the colour of rich, decadent toffee brushed her shoulders in soft waves framing an oval-shaped face with finely drawn features. Her smile rivalled the Mona Lisa's for mysteriousness. Her eyes, a brilliant robin egg blue, held a promise for him alone. And damn his slow-to-learn heart, he'd wanted to make promises in return. He blamed TV and movies for the style, tricking viewers into thinking facial expressions are the only body language worth attention. The shot had to be airbrushed, right? Liam knew he was a victim of slick marketing. But his fingers had itched to trace the flawless ivory of her skin, to linger on the sexy freckles smattered across her nose. Maybe the overwork was getting to him. Belatedly, he tuned into the cabbie's chatter, some jumbled story about an advertising exec with a clever idea becoming the female model for the billboard. When Liam had scanned the rest of the billboard, he'd been catapulted into a parallel universe. The male model's face was a charcoal outline with only the eyes showing. The same steady grey eyes Liam saw reflected every morning in his mirror. Sweet Mary and Joseph, Neil? Liam's brother had shared art history classes with a twin at university. He talked about her because of the coincidence of her also being identical. Turner, a common enough name. What was her first name? Abby, Ali, Anna? 
Liam's instincts were screaming that Neil and his friend Anna were the billboard models and Kate Turner was the model's sister. Weird, but on a par with everything else in this bizarre day. What's going on, George? Asking the obvious question risked implying George was barking mad. After this morning's multiple shocks, Liam wasn't sure he gave a damn. George's move upended all past certainties, threatening established rat runs to the top of the company. The other three lawyers sharing this table were as hungry for promotion as Liam was. The older man's eyebrow shot up in amusement. Liam was positive it was amusement, but he'd seen law interns' knees knock when first spotlighted by that cryptic expression. What's it look like? George's fingers steepled against the table. Like you're making a move into the political, financial and emotional quagmire of environmental law. His boss was the one person in the company who knew Liam wouldn't touch environmental law and why. It's a broad and interesting field. Stuff nice it is. With his backside rooted to his chair, Liam was free falling through his known world. Crap. As you said, you've made your fortune and your reputation through intellectual property law. Liam gestured to the three silent lawyers. That's why the rest of us are here. Oh, the cases are current, with environmentalists pitted against big companies, often transglobal companies, piped up one of Liam's colleagues. The young gun had been busy in the few hours they'd had the report. In most cases, the Greenies are struggling to fund legal representation for their cases. Yes, and we could help, George said, blindsiding his team. Why? Liam asked. My daughters have convinced me it's my responsibility to do something real about climate change if I care about their futures. George ranked his daughter's wants and needs higher than any profit margin. Make a donation to Greenpeace or Sea Shepherd or any one of a dozen other charities. Liam glared at George. His boss knew what he was asking and Liam didn't know if he had it in him to venture back into that fire. My girls are looking for a more personal, tangible commitment. George was unfazed while Liam's colleagues left him to pose the tricky questions. We'll pilot one case, George held up a hand, then decide on next steps. If Liam didn't put forward a project, he could kiss his partnership dream goodbye for the next few years. He'd also have to play junior to a successful colleague. Company profits will fund the pilot case. George lobbed a bouncing bomb into the mix with predictable consequences. Liam almost grinned at the dismayed expression on his colleagues' faces. My share of company profits, George added. His boss was committed to this decision. The collective release of breath told Liam his boss had been testing them. Participation is voluntary and won't impact your job, but I expect absolute confidentiality. If there's a leak, I'll make sure you never work at this level again. George's basculous stare underlined his threat. We're picking four cases at random from a list this Kate Turner has supplied. By the way, who is she? What are her qualifications? Liam asked. A librarian and researcher. Only does a finite amount of research. A close friend recommended her. Described her as meticulous, discreet and creative. She doesn't advertise what she does, word of mouth only. Liam's mind filled with the image of the prim researcher. Her horn-rimmed round spectacles accentuated her eyes. He'd been jolted to find his mouth watering when she'd pushed them back up her nose. He'd watched her through the meeting, following the arguments and getting pissed off when he'd wanted her out. You trust her? Liam searched George's face for the slightest hesitation. Do you know a reason why I shouldn't? George countered. Very nice. Okay, I'm I'm completely hooked. Completely and utterly hooked. As <laughs> I am with all of your work. You're just you're such a wonderful writer. So Thank you. I have three questions. The first is more a comment than a question. The stickiness of impending mutiny. 
Where on earth did you come up with that phrase? It was so good. I had to write it down. <laughs> I know it's one I'm really proud of. I'm, <laughs> you I'm not quite be. sure. I'm not sh- quite sure when. It um it just popped into my head one day when I was writing and I thought that's it. That's what it's like in that meeting when you've got someone announcing something and everyone else is really no, you didn't just <laughs> say that. Um yeah, I was pleased with that one. I love I love the the emotional and tactile kind of vying for top dog in that statement it's it's like there's a there's an emotional tactile kind of tug of war going on is very yeah. cool this is a yeah. very very cool phrase well done <laughs> <laughs> that's really nice um and there were so many other phrases but i couldn't write them fast enough i wanted to listen <laughs> so but that that's amazing um so the the second thing is I, I have a curiosity about how did you find the challenge of writing identical twins yet making this an autonomous individual as well, right? So Kate and Liam are both identical, but they're both their own people, as I'm assuming their siblings are as well. So how did you find that challenge so okay they're they're exactly the same right down to dna except how did you figure the, I, that um, puzzle yes and uh it it goes back to uh backstory which i haven't uh completely revealed yet and you uh, should cuz we need to read it <laughs> <laughs> Um, Kate, uh, the writing that she wants to do is mm. she's um, a romance writer and she started writing romance and escaping into romance as a child. And uh, her parents are uh, a famous playwright of serious plays and literature and her mother is a literary fiction author. Uh, and okay. her father was outraged at her interest in romance as a young child and her father was fated by the whole world as as being various things. And so the girls got trotted out and they each adopted their different way of rebellion in a way. So she retreated into, into romance that, and wanting frivolous, the happy ever after. That and, frivolous Yes, everything that's right. Great and her sister, thing. her sister yeah. acted out uh, like, almost as ways of getting attention, but differently. The boys, the boys are so close, uh, and the boys were uh, incredibly close until the last couple of years. And um, the brother, who is not you, who you will meet in this book, um, is actually a master carpenter, and uh, he'd won a uh mentorship to go to Ireland and he went to Ireland and it was just at that point that their father died and um am I revealing too much anyway um there was a difference about uh it was, How the, they father's handled that. It yeah. was the father's death and some secrets that Liam uncovered the he was the okay. brother back in Australia dealing with it some secrets he uncovered so you you basically because I I I'm stopping you here because I don't want you to reveal. Too no, much. no, to reveal the whole story. Yes. Um, but so, as you were writing these four characters who are in some respects shadows of each other, did you hear Kate at one point, for instance, saying, "Anna would never say that; she would say it this way." Did you did you have the characters kind of? remind I did you I of definitely their had I definitely had their responses uh more the women definitely had Kate and Anna having quite different reactions because of that retreat so so did you have, so did you have yourself having conversations with the four of them kind of round robin <laughs> as you were writing <laughs> More the two of them, more the two, more the each set of twins with, okay. with each other, with each other. Yes, yes. That's that's so much fun. Um, I I'm really excited to read this. And then, 
So book it, two is out. And what's book two the, is out, which what's is the called title Quinn. For book two? Quinn. And book Quinn three. Quinn by design. And book three? Betrayal. It's out in October and it's Anna's story. Very fun. So a lot of people, uh, so I worried about, I mean, you as a as an editor and writer yourself, in, in book one of a series, you've sort of got that tumble of introducing everyone and trying sure. to keep them separate and not overcomplicate the beginning, which which I worried about a bit. But Anna, I kept getting people telling me, oh, when's Anna's story coming out? And I mm. thought, right, no pressure here. Yeah, <laughs> right. Well, I love how you describe it as a tumble because that's truly what it is. Yes, when, yes. when you sit down to take on a project like this, it is just one thing after another. Yeah. <laughs> so, and, and trying kind of to tail constantly and trying, trying to remember when um, Anna was, when Kate was Miss Dowdy mm. so that technically no one should recognize her as her twin. Cause she mm. was Miss Dowdy at this yes. point and yeah. Anna never dressed down in any way shape or form having them step in and out of those disguises i would think would be yes. challenging as the author behind it yes yeah, so kate's the only one who uses disguises well okay that makes it helpful <laughs> yes yes i mean as a writer i would see how that rule would make it helpful <laughs> <laughs> because i've known some identical twins in my lifetime and if one of them would just listen to that rule, it would have been a lot easier to deal with the pair. <laughs> I'm so excited for this new series and for your writing career. You are just blowing up Australia and the world, and I'm I'm so excited for you. I, I wish you all the very, very best with the new series. And please come back and read the next two books for us. Okay. I'd love to. I'd love to. Have an awesome spring. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk again soon. We actually had a week last week of ridiculous temperatures, over 30. So And hot winds, and it's gone back a bit this week, yeah. I have to do the math. So if 30 is somewhere around 80? Over 100. Over 100. Wow. Okay. Again, yeah, hot, See? hot, hot. That, that kind of gives everybody an impression about why I'm an, a book editor and not a mathematician because, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us again. I look Thank forward you, to having Diana. you back. Thanks, Diana. Bye.